Hello everyone and welcome back to Arctic Retro and uh, today I have another MSX machine for you. Except for the Spectra video, video I made a while back, I haven't really featured uh, any MSX machines and uh, the Spectra video wasn't really an MSX machine at all, but uh, the MSX machines were based on the architecture of the Spectra video SVI 328. Alright, so let's take a look at this machine. Uh, it's uh, Philips, says here on the cover. And here it is, it's a Philips VG8235. Let's take a closer look at the machine. It actually looks uh, fairly nice. Uh, you can see it has been used because uh, <laughs> the gray color has disappeared here where the, the hands have rested. But otherwise it looks in good condition. So this is an MSX2 machine. And it says here 64K ROM, 256K RAM, that's a lot, and a 360K disk drive capacity. Keyboard uh, looks and uh, feels alright. It has this uh, lock mechanism. You can uh, lower the keyboard or raise it. Not really sure if you can take it off. No, you can't. Let's take a look at the back side. Yeah, there's an expansion slot called slot 2. It has a RF channel 36 PAL output. This seems to be a tape port and a printer port. It has a SCART output. That's really nice for the audio and video out. It has an external floppy disk drive connection port, a monitor power and the AC 220 volt. And uh, on the other side there's the three and a half inch uh, floppy drive and uh, two joystick ports. So this is um, some kind of machine that actually has a lot of features seems like. This machine was actually a donation for my channel and uh, it's a great donation from uh, Martin Loopstar, so I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Martin. All right, that was the overview of the machine. Uh, now I'm gonna power it on. I'm not really sure if it works. I did briefly test it when I got it, and it had some issues, a weird issue with the picture. Um, uh, I only used the RF then, so uh, let's power it on. Hopefully there's no <laughs> reefer caps or anything that can blow up. And in the power supply of this machine. It has a built-in power supply. All right, uh, finally I have a machine that actually matches uh, the monitor I got, Philips. <laughs> All right, MSX. And the floppy drive is uh, hacking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. That's the issue I had when I tested it. It, um, <laughs> well, the screen is uh, obviously uh, restricted with the number of characters <laughs> and the green text on the blue background. Uh, that's not a very nice combination. So <laughs> what's the matter with this? I'm not sure, I have to check it out. Maybe this is some mode or something. The keyboard is kind of, uh, little bad. Some keys are a little hard to to press. Like the J, no J. Before I investigate the screen issue, I'm gonna test with a SCART cable. <laughs> it will probably have the same issue, but um, 
at least the picture will be uh, cleaner. Yeah, that's a lot better. <laughs> but still the same issue, the <laughs> I have never seen that before, so that needs to be taken care of, I guess. I need to do some research to figure out what is uh, wrong with this. I actually got a tip um, on my YouTube channel uh, as a comment in uh, the unboxing video for this machine and it uh, told me to type uh, width 40 to see if that changed the uh, width. <laughs> it actually worked, so <laughs> but uh, that's a little bit strange. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's try width 80. Huh. It actually got 80 column. Great. With 100. No, that's not legal. The screen width uh, defaults back to uh, four characters uh, uh, after resetting. Anyway, I'm gonna test a game now. I only got one game cartridge uh, for MSX, and uh, since all MSX machines are compatible, it should work on this machine. Yes, it does, <laughs> and no issues with the screen width uh, there, so I guess it's only in basic that there's an issue. And the sound is working. All right. <laughs> I always die at the, even the first possible chance of dying. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not very familiar with uh, the basic on the MSX machines, but uh, apparently if you change uh, like the width and the screen resolution, uh, you can save this by typing set the screen and that will uh, save that to the SRAM of uh, the real-time clock inside this machine so um, yeah depending uh, on if there's a battery that's removed or anything like that maybe it's not uh, gonna save it but uh, I'm gonna try and reset now yeah that worked <laughs> fantastic so uh, Maybe someone once before did this with uh, with a screen width of uh, only four, or maybe it defaults to four if the battery runs out or, or anything like that. It will be interesting to see when I open up this machine if there's um, a battery inside. All right, the machine is working as uh, expected. Uh, this far, at least, uh, my plan now for this video is to actually disassemble the machine and uh, do all the cleaning stuff that I usually do and uh, after that we'll see if we can uh, try and load something from uh, some tape archive files. <laughs> okay, is it off? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And then we have uh, ground wiring and uh, ribbon cables for the keyboard. And to remove the keyboard, you need to take off these um, flat flex cables, uh, which are actually just extended over here. A lot of ground, three ground cables. I'm gently gonna just take off the flat flex here. Pull them straight out. They seem to be holding up. That's the inside of the machine and uh, <laughs> there's always something new to see like this uh, big voltage regulator block and this big heatsink. So it's a STK 7561A. I'm not familiar with that one, but uh, 
yeah, seems a little bit uh, strange and a lot of uh, contacts to the motherboard. And here's the power supply with this uh, big transformer and uh, a few caps, no refus luckily. There's the floppy drive and uh, I'm gonna take out that one because I want to clean it up. Motherboard isn't uh, too big actually, there's a TMS2793, is that the graphics chip? I don't remember. Here's a chip with um, a heatsink, maybe that is the graphic chip. Uh, the CPU is probably hidden underneath, I'm gonna try and remove everything so that we can get a clean look at the motherboard. Okay, only two screws for that. All right, one floppy drive. There's the set 80 CPU. And now you can hear the fighter planes are out uh, on a mission again. <laughs> So I just want to take it off to take a peek. I'm not gonna actually remove the cables because uh, yeah, there's always a risk by ripping out these old contacts. Uh, okay, so these seem to be uh, just some extension of the motherboard. Little RF modulator and uh, printer out and the monitor out. And yes, look at that. That's a battery, memo power date code uh, if that's the date code it's 86 so it doesn't appear to have leaked uh, not really sure what i should do with it uh, probably a good idea to remove it but then it won't save uh, settings let's see if there's any voltage on it just as the test uh, for this short time i had this machine on it might have gotten some charge 1.3 volts. Thing is, it's a very wide battery, so uh, the plus is on this side and the minus here, so it might be hard to find some suitable replacement that fits, but you can always uh, come around that with some wires or something. But it's a 2.4 uh, volt battery, so uh, 1.3 is uh, not a lot. But uh, then again, I hadn't had the time to have this machine on, so it might take some charge if it stays on for a while. All right, I think that's enough with the cleaning of uh, the inside of this machine. Um, use a little bit of um, contact cleaner on the different uh, contacts. Next, I'm gonna take a look at the floppy drive and uh, by the looks of it, it looks like it's uh, one of those with uh, a drive belt. <laughs> so uh, then I'm really, <laughs> I'm wondering if uh, the belt is okay. If not, I don't have a spare, so we'll see. Oh no, <laughs> yeah. So um, there is some remains of the belt. It has completely disintegrated. It's just like some <laughs> liquid, like, uh, yeah, like chewing gum. <laughs> So uh, then this drive is not usable. I don't have spare belt. Um, I'm not sure if I can uh, get one in time for this video either, but uh, I will definitely try and I will definitely uh, try and use another drive or something like that. So now I'm just trying to, <laughs> to <laughs> scrape off this uh, rotten, uh, rubber belt. Oh no, look at this mess. There's even some <laughs> parts over here. Yeah, and there's some bits <laughs> all over the place. And it's sticky as hell, so <laughs> seems like IPA is uh, dissolving it, so... Uh <laughs> hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, I think uh, the wheel here is uh, completely clean. I'm gonna take off um, the top and then we can inspect uh, inside and clean uh, the drive head. PCB looks uh, just fine. So now it's free. First I just clean a little bit uh, around the mechanism here. Oops, <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. And then I'm cleaning the drive axle for the stepper motor. Finally, with a clean uh, cotton swab, I am uh, cleaning the drive head or the read and write head. I just wipe it uh, over and uh, then I turn it around for the clean side and uh, wipe some more. Finally, a little uh, lubrication and uh, I'm using uh, silicone grease. Put some uh, tiny amount on the drive axle or the motor and just a little bit here on the part where the head is sliding. You know what? I'm gonna do a little experiment. I have a little uh, rubber band here and uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try this one. It is uh, <laughs> the width is perfect but maybe it's not tight enough. Um, <laughs> like that <laughs> so yeah it might work seems to be holding <laughs> very nicely i have started to assemble uh, the machine now and uh, this might just be temporary i might uh, want to take this out once more <laughs> the keyboard is uh, next uh, yeah and i want to remove it completely because i want to clean up this um, case part. So I'm simply gonna try and uh, remove these screws on the side. No, that's just for the locking mechanism. <laughs> but there are some uh, big screws here. So the smaller ones are for the back plate, I guess, but uh, the larger screws, maybe those are the ones that are uh, keeping the keyboard to the case. I usually don't uh, look at uh, other videos be before I start uh, uh, the work on the machines, but uh, <laughs> sometimes if I get stuck, I might find a video and take a look. Yeah, now it's loose. No, this one can go to the bath and take a uh, soapy spa bath with some hot water. <laughs> Let's see now, it's uh, quite dirty uh, underneath. There is some uh, stuff here. So I want to remove all the keys and uh, to do that I use my um, trusty old uh, key cap puller. I'm not really sure how the mechanism is for these keys. So uh, I want to be careful <laughs> in the beginning not use too much force, at least until I understand how it works. Yeah, that gave way quite easily, so... As you can see, it's just some uh, plastic tabs, actually. One on each side that goes down through a hole, so uh, nothing much to it. Hopefully we won't break off these tabs. Uh, I actually found it easier to just use my fingers. They're not that hard to get up. This larger key have some metal support, so you need to be careful about them. Because uh, some of the keys uh, didn't work properly and uh, some were uh, very hard to press, I'm gonna remove uh, the back plate to uh, clean up the PCB inside. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna use my electric screwdriver on these small screws. Oops, some of them are too hard. <laughs> I 
All right, let's see what we got. Oh, it's uh, one of those uh, lousy keyboard membranes and it's full of dust and shit. And here's all, <laughs> all these uh, plastic uh, <laughs> springs and there's a lot of dust and uh, dirt on everything. The space bar and a few other keys uh, actually needs to be <laughs> taken off from the inside. So uh, <laughs> yeah, try and take out these um, metal supports. Oh, now I feel dirty. <laughs> All right, so now the complete uh, keyboard plate can be cleaned real good. Uh, so that's the uh, benefit of taking off all the keycaps. The keyboard membrane, it's uh, of plastic and it's uh, separated in two layers uh, and the layers are just uh, stick together with this tape. <laughs> so I'm not really sure how to best uh, clean this but uh, I think on the top layer uh, I can use some uh, alcohol just to get away all the dust and dirt and uh, on the inside, I don't want to use alcohol because these are probably uh, some carbon coated pads that uh, you shouldn't really clean off. <laughs> Alrighty. On the inside, I'm just gonna use a clean uh, cotton pad and uh, just wipe away uh, any uh, loose dirt. All right, that was all the cleaning of uh, the keyboard. So I'm uh, gonna start assembling it again. I already put back uh, these uh, rubber uh, <laughs> springs. Not really sure what they're called. Well, let's see now if we can uh, place back uh, these keys that have the support bars. Oops, oops. <laughs> Yeah, that works. So let's insert the uh, keycaps. That's a big improvement, I must admit. There might be a little bit of a yellowing on these gray keys, but I don't think that's uh, noticeable at all. Um, you can see it on the sides of the keys that they change color further down where the light hasn't reached. <laughs> anyway, now it's time to um, put the keyboard back into the case and uh, Actually, one of the screw standoffs here broke off when I took out the keyboard, so um, I'm gonna glue that on first. So let's see if a little uh, super glue can help on this. A little additional glue on the sides just to strengthen it a little bit. Well, that should do it. All 
All right, that's it. The keyboard is, um, yeah, assembled again. I actually noticed when I tried to clean this uh, <laughs> this upper case that the, the <laughs> silver color wears off really easily. So I just use a little um, little bit of force uh, when cleaning, and uh, you can see <laughs> it rubbed off some of the colors. Yeah, as you can see, working with this machine rubs off the color. So I might try to paint this uh, sometime later. I'm not really sure if it's worth it. So I'm gonna assemble uh, the machine now and <laughs> I wonder why they actually needed uh, three of these uh, really thick ground wires. Uh, that's a little bit uh, overkill I, I think. So let's see now if we can uh, put this back together again. I added the keyboard now and it uh, looks to be working just fine. All the keys are, yeah, responding very nicely. I had an issue with space being uh, pressed uh, continuously, but it seems to have uh, vanished now. So uh, <laughs> what I'm gonna do now is to try and see if the floppy drive works. I found an old uh, floppy disk and I'm gonna try and uh, format it and uh, the command for that is call format oops call format drive name a press any key when ready <laughs> yeah seems to be working <laughs> with my rubber band fix So it uh, finished. Uh, it's uh, very noisy the drive, but I can live with that. So let's see now if we make a little program. Key there. What I want to do is to save and uh, in the documentation I find that you use uh, this notation here, A colon for device A and uh, then um, file name comma A oops disk IO error <laughs> so uh, the disk might be uh, bad but uh, you should see the files on the disk by typing files Yeah, disk offline. <laughs> so I'm gonna try another disk just to um, check. Now I'm formatting a brand new floppy disk from this unopened box, which is now an opened box. <laughs> so uh, the actual formatting seems to be um, running as normal, but uh, at the end it just tries to write something and uh, then fails with a disk error. So. I'm not really sure what's um, the matter here. And whatever type of uh, disk command I try to run, it just comes back with the disk offline. No disk offline. <laughs> All right, so I think maybe this uh, floppy drive is uh, not very healthy at the moment. And uh, maybe the <laughs> uh, rubber band didn't work as good as I thought, but um, I'm not giving up on this yet. All right, so uh, the rubber band in the floppy drive uh, doesn't work very well. I had it out and uh, actually it uh, rubs against uh, <laughs> the outer casing when it uh, turns and that's why it was a bit noisy and uh, yeah, that obviously doesn't work. I have ordered uh, new belts that are uh, the ones that's supposed to go with this drive. So uh, hopefully they will arrive soon, but uh, probably not in <laughs> time for this video. However, I have this. Uh, this is a GoTech uh, floppy drive emulator and uh, it has the flash floppy uh, firmware. The internal drive has a connector that is uh, not compatible with uh, this one, so uh, if I'm gonna replace the internal drive, then I have to make uh, some sort of an adapter. 
which I'm not gonna do. Uh, however, this machine has an external floppy drive uh, contact and uh, yeah, that should be um, the same contact. So I'm gonna just uh, insert that now if I can find it. Yeah, this is a regular 34 pin uh, floppy drive connector. So just insert it like that and uh, that should do. Uh, it's a little bit uh, short uh, the cable here but uh, <laughs> I yeah if I put it like that upside down it will work. The GoTag uses a regular um, USB memory drive so I'm just gonna put one in here. I have already prepared uh, with some files. I actually went to planetemu.net. Uh, here's a big archive of MSX uh, and MSX2 games. So uh, I downloaded this one, uh, 1942. And one more thing, uh, if you use uh, Flash Floppy, you have this ff.config file and uh, you actually need to um, edit that and uh, you need to set the host platform to uh, msx so i already did that host equals msx and that's all the changes i have done for the jumper settings all you need to do is uh, to uh, set the jumper on s1 because this in, is uh, drive one or the external drive <laughs> s0 indicates uh, internal drive on most of the platforms. All right, let's see if this works. Um, uh, now we need some uh, power to this uh, GoTech drive. Um, and for that, I actually just gonna use uh, a five volt USB charger that I have, but uh, I just use these um, alligator clips simple as that uh, this is just a temporary test so i'm not going to install this gotek into this uh, machine uh, this is the gotek i use for testing on many kinds of machines let's see now if this works turning on and uh, the gotek drive booted um, if there's something wrong if you have the ribbon cable the wrong way then this display will show rib but now it shows it's on uh, disk image number one. And of course this is upside down now. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna change to disk image number zero. And uh, let's see now, turn on the machine. Yeah, and you can see it actually activated. Uh, something happened, it tried to boot, I think. I'm not really sure. No, the disk, uh, the external disk drive is now uh, drive B. The internal one is A, so we actually need to, uh, I'm gonna try first and, and format uh, drive B. See if we have uh, more success. Select B and uh, single side or double side. All right, so it supports uh, double sided uh, disks. Uh, actually, that's uh, great. So we select that. All right, so now it starts uh, formatting, actually. It counts up uh, the tracks now, 15, 16, probably will go to 80. Even though this is a fast USB memory, <laughs> the floppy operations still takes the same time as uh, on the original uh, floppy drive. Okay, format complete. Uh, that's a good sign. <laughs> it actually seems to be working. Let's see now if I make a small program. And save it to uh, B. Yeah, that worked. <laughs> Let's try and load it back. It's empty now and uh, load. Nice. That worked. Great. 
And there's actually the directory command, it is uh, files. Oh, it will obviously use the default drive, which is A, so let's try files B. Yes, that worked. <laughs> nice. So now I'm going to change to uh, image number two, which, um, or actually number one, which uh, should be uh, the game 1942. So let's see if the machine can actually boot from um, the external drive. I have, uh, by the way, disconnected uh, the internal one because it just made a lot of noise when you start up and it uh, obviously is uh, grinding onto the <laughs> rubber band. I haven't taken it out yet. So let's see now. So it didn't boot from uh, B. I'm not really sure how you can do that. Um, there might be some uh, jumper or something in the machine to change the boot order. I haven't researched that, but uh, let's see what's on that uh, disk. All right, so there's a um, bunch of files, 1942, and there's a com file, and there's an auto exec bus. That reminds me of auto exec bat on the PC. <laughs> Probably that's the one we should try and run. And for that we can use the run command and prefix b colon uh, auto exec dot bus. Okay, so it came out with uh, disk offline in 10. <laughs> Probably it is hard-coded to use drive A and <laughs> so let's see the program should be loaded now. Let's list it. Yeah, it says run 1942. So then we need to change that code to B colon 1942. Maybe that works. All right, it does something. It asks for a monitor one or TV two. <laughs> I guess this is a TV. It comes out from the SCART connector, so I select two. Okay, disk offline in two. <laughs> so didn't we just change that? Maybe it tries to load something else. Okay, so there's even another loader here. Let's see. Hmm. So it just asks for the monitor or TV and takes input and then it tries to load. It uses B load, which is binary load. So we probably have to prefix there as well. Oh, I see there's more places it tries to load there. Yeah, down here as well. So it actually loads the binary files into different memory areas uh, in this uh, program. Uh, now we should have changed that to uh, B colon. Yeah, let's try and run it. TV. All right, it loads. <laughs> I'm not uh, really sure this game will work on this machine. We can always hope. I'm not really sure how the compatibility is and uh, what I've downloaded. <laughs> hey, hey, look at that. <laughs> 1942. Push space key. Oh! <laughs> nice! That worked. Okay, I died instantly, which I always do. <laughs> All right, <laughs> nice. 
So this was quite uh, playable, uh, actually using the keyboard. I used to play this a lot uh, on the Commodore 64 back in the day. <laughs> so that was uh, great. I didn't anticipate it to be working. Uh, let's see if we can find another game. Let's try and run uh, B auto dot bus. Uh, no, it's actually auto exec, but this one. So this must actually be a DOS <laughs> game then. I'm pretty sure this machine is not compatible with um, DOS without running some DOS disks first, but it has command com and MSX DOS is. <laughs> Let's try this one. Uh, so this is uh, Bubble Bubble and it has an auto exec bus. So it's the same issue, disk offline in 10, so uh, just gonna modify the program with the B column. Disk offline in 10, uh, but now we have the B there, so um, let's just try and load that. It says disk offline, but uh, it is there, so... Hmm. I tried a few different games, but uh, they all seem to have some uh, auto run feature or something that uh, even if you load from B, it uh, just auto runs some basic and tries to load from A, so I couldn't uh, run them. So uh, I think I'm gonna stop now with the GoTech. If only I could get this working as uh, drive A, I would be happy, but I actually tried and insert it um, by swapping uh, the contacts uh, on the motherboard uh, between the two floppy disk connectors, the one that goes out in the back and the one that goes to the actual floppy drive, but uh, uh, somehow uh, that doesn't work, uh, then it won't detect the GoTech as a drive and I also changed um, the jumper but um, no luck. So if there are some uh, MSX uh, experts out there that can uh, give me some advice please uh, comment below the video. Disk based games perhaps is and was a little bit uh, difficult so was a little bit difficult on these machines back in the day. Um, however uh, this machine uh, also has uh, tape port so I was thinking next step is to try and load some uh, stuff from tape. This is the cassette uh, port on this computer it's uh, called rec slash mag <laughs> not really sure what mag stands for. This is an 8 pin uh, DIN connector. This connector has uh, signals for audio input and output as well as uh, remote control signals. On msx.org you find the description of this uh, 8 pin uh, connector and uh, the pinouts. So what I'm gonna do first is to actually make a cable for this and I have this um, actually this is a 7 pin uh, DIN connector so it's uh, missing one pin but uh, that's no problem because uh, you actually don't need uh, 8 pins because there are several ground pins on the pinout for uh, this connector. Here I got the parts I need. I have some uh, wire here. This is uh, for strain wire and um, I have a 3.5 millimeter and 2.5 millimeter audio jacks here and I'm only gonna make this cable able to uh, read data from a cassette recorder. I'm not gonna make the cable able to write data because I doubt I'll ever need that. Yeah and because this wire has four uh, wires inside uh, that's enough for uh, the audio input and the ground and the remote control plus and minus. So that's four leads. And this is the pinout, uh, the cable. I'm gonna use this uh, DIN connector as I said, and this is uh, the male. So it's this one. 
and uh, I'm always <laughs> wondering is this seen from the front or the back of the contact? Um, so I actually googled a bit and I didn't find a conclusive answer but it seems like um, when you see a pinout uh, like this it's actually seen from the front of the contacts from the tip of the pins so I'm gonna gamble with that because this document doesn't say so what I'm gonna wire up now is uh, one of the grounds um, pin 8 in the middle which we are missing is ground so uh, can't use that uh, but we have pin 1 so I'm gonna choose pin 1 it's uh, ground and uh, for uh, the for the sound input it's this pin 5 cmt in one pin 5 and uh, for the remote control we have this rem plus and rem minus which is uh, 6 and 7 And yeah, it's always a pain to solder uh, these thin contacts because um, for one, if you're not too quick, uh, you can actually damage the contact because the pin is melting and uh, getting loose in the plastic and you have to arrange uh, <laughs> yeah, the small wires uh, to fit in these small holes, so uh, not easy at all. And since we now uh, see the contact from uh, the behind, we have to uh, turn around <laughs> the <laughs> the pin numbers uh, in this case so it will be opposite anyway I start by applying a little bit of a flux on each of um, the little uh, contacts so now we have a steady position of the two first wires let's see now if I can solder this without um, messing it up <laughs> So, I think that's it. When you get the first uh, wire soldered on, it's uh, a lot easier with the rest. That was the soldering, and if this uh, was uh, correct, then uh, we're good to go on this side. For the other side of the cable, I'll just uh, gather the two pairs together and um, yeah, I put some uh, heat shrink tube over uh, the two pairs, like this. Oh, <laughs> and uh, as usual, I almost forgot you must remember to take <laughs> the cap on. <laughs> Alright, so I soldered it in, I forgot to uh, film it, but uh, I think that uh, went well. This is a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. All right, that's one cable for uh, MSX uh, cassette loading. <laughs> Let's test. And for testing I'm going to use this one, it's a Castuino, it's an Arduino nano based device that uh, emulates a, a cassette player and it takes uh, CAS files which uh, this machine can load from. Of course you can load from a, a real cassette player or um, yeah, playing audio out from a phone or a laptop or anything like that, but uh, this is a very nice to have device and it shows the files on this little uh, OLED screen and lets you select uh, the different games you want to load. And then it should uh, come up with a menu here. So it's called Max Duino, actually the software I installed on this. Uh, so I have different things here but uh, let's enter the MSX folder. And here I have, uh, for example, a boulder dash. But uh, when you select it, it's uh, paused. And now we actually <laughs> need to do the important thing to connect the new audio cable. So it has uh, one uh, input for uh, or audio output 
and one for the remote control. Yeah, to load the game from a cassette, you type, um, for example, run cas colon. So let's see now. Okay, so uh, I actually measured on the connector on the machine and the pin uh, number one, which I assumed was ground, is actually not connected to ground. Uh, however, pin two is, so I need to change uh, pin one uh, wire to number two. Now then, <laughs> playing. Hey, hey yeah, <laughs> now it's working. Found the dash, nice. And I hear the clicking, uh, some uh, relay is clicking, that's uh, the remote control that uh, controls when uh, <laughs> the, the cassette player should uh, stop and start. And now we see the status and uh, how far it's uh, come. Almost there, 99%. Okay, so, <laughs> well, it uh, finished loaded and then it uh, crashed. <laughs> yeah, takes a while with these uh, tape games. <laughs> so it finished loading, uh, however, it doesn't start. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on. It was the same with uh, Bruce Lee. That might be a compatibility issue, or it might be something wrong with the machine, some memory issue, or anything, <laughs> and hard to tell. Loading a Spy vs. Spy 2. Let's see if this works. Stand by while game loads the Iceland Caper. I saw this on uh, some other uh, games. <laughs> it actually stops with the remove disk drive or press shift and reset. That's a little bit strange. Okay, maybe that's um, how you disable the disk drive. Yeah, holding shift while resetting uh, obviously worked. Uh, no, I didn't get that message about the disk drive. All right, finally a game that uh, started. <laughs> yeah, and the joystick works too. <laughs> Spy vs. Spy, it's a very fun game. Uh, I used to play a lot back in the day on the Commodore 64. The goal is to uh, win over the other spy by uh, setting up some traps and moving through different areas, finding items. But I don't think I ever played this version. The graphic wasn't uh, very good, the colors are a little bit bad and uh, seems like a slow game, moving slowly. Let's try this one, Boulder Dash 2. I know I actually held down Shift Reset uh, from the start. Maybe that's the reason the other games wouldn't load. So I actually googled a bit and um, it turns out if you um, hold down shift while resetting and then it disables um, the disk basic and uh, you get the more free uh, RAM. <laughs> nice. Boulder Dash, uh, that's a great game. Played it a lot on the Commodore 64. So this is a maze and you must avoid getting the <laughs> boulders in your head and uh, you need to find your way through the maze, solve different uh, tasks so and you cannot touch those moving objects <laughs> like that. <laughs> nice. What's this then? <laughs> Red lights of Amsterdam. Red lights of Amsterdam sounds a little bit uh, shady. <laughs> Well, 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 what's this then? Just a minute, I'm undressing. <laughs> is this what I uh, am thinking it is? <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, exactly what I thought it was. Uh, it's uh, strip poker. Okay, so it has speech as well. Okay, I'll stop here. The Barbarian game just hang after uh, completed loading. So I don't know if it's uh, not compatible with this machine or something like that. Anyway, uh, I think uh, that's it for this video. I did a lot of uh, exploration of the MSX platform and uh, it seems like a great platform. So the success rate of running games from uh, tape or floppy disk uh, was uh, so and so, but uh, that's how it is uh, with these old machines. 
and uh, it takes a lot of time also to check out uh, all the different games because they take like five to ten minutes to load so <laughs> yeah it's a bit time consuming uh, one thing i didn't uh, do and uh, that was to fix uh, the floppy drive and i'm still waiting for a new drive belt because there was a couple of things I wanted to do with the machine uh, with a working floppy drive as drive A. So that was it for this video. Hope you enjoyed uh, this content. If you did then uh, please hit the subscribe and the like button. And as always uh, thanks a lot to my supporters at the Patreon. Thanks bye bye.